Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Molly Matson. She's a wildlife biologist and a senior scientist at the Center for Biological Diversity. She advocates for imperiled species such as bats, wolves, and lynx, and all things wild. So first, I would like to really thank you for your work, and then next, I would like to thank you for being on the program. Oh, thanks, Derek. I'm really pleased to be here with you today. So I would like to... Um, I mean, if we want to talk about wolves and lynx, that would be fine, but I really would like to at least start by focusing on bats. And can you um, presume that people who are listening to this care about bats, but they might not know what's happening? So can mm-hmm. you tell me about um, some, of the, some of the concerns that bats in the United States right now are facing, or North America? Yeah. Well, bats have been facing a number of significant threats for a while. Most recently, they've been facing a disease called white nose syndrome, which uh, first showed up about uh, seven, eight years ago. But even before then, and I'll talk more about that, but even before white nose syndrome showed up, bats had been in trouble because of direct persecution from people, uh, people going into caves and either inadvertently or purposefully uh, killing bats and disturbing them when they're hibernating. And then uh, prior to white nose syndrome showing up, uh, scientists were actually very concerned about wind energy, industrial wind energy being a threat to bats because there are certain species that appear to be very susceptible to getting whacked by these turbines when they're in migration. So those were were big concerns. And then in 2006, this disease, which is a fungal disease, apparently... Wait, can we we go on about the wind energy? I think that's that's a point a lot of people don't understand. Can we talk about that? How... Yeah. Excuse me. What happens to them? Why do they, why do they end up flying? Why do they end up getting harmed by them? Mm-hmm. Well, we have uh, three species of bats that are uh, migratory, uh, kind of like birds. They appear to move, uh, you know, north and south through the seasons. And when they are in migration, in particular, they seem to be tracking these routes that put them in the paths of these big wind energy, you know, construction. And so they're particularly susceptible in the late summer, early fall when they're, when they're moving. And they, scientists don't really know why the bats are, appear to be attracted to the turbines, but they do appear to be attracted to the turbines. And they get within range of these gigantic blades that are spanning, you know, hundreds of miles an hour, at the tips of the blades, and they either get directly um, hit by the blade or they suffer um, kind of like a severe case of the bend because there's a huge pressure differential in the area surrounding the blade, and so essentially their insides rupture. Um, But there have been some very large uh, kills of bats um, in parts of uh, North America, particularly in the uh, Appalachian Mountains. And isn't there um, something? Um, doesn't it it uh, the the rapidly rotating blades? Does that mess with their echolocation? Is that is that part of why they may be? Is that one of the theories on why they may be um, get confused around them? Um, or is that just well, wrong? Well, that I no, I haven't read that, but it's you know their echolocation may not be up to snuff when you're dealing with something that's moving as fast as the tip of a of a gigantic uh, wind turbine blade. Um, and because they're also uh, in in migration, and it's also during their mating season, they frankly may be rather distracted. Um, but no one really knows exactly why uh, in particular bats are so susceptible to getting hit and by the ta- turbines, except, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and um, there are other species of bats that also um, are being affected by this, but the the three main species that are being affected, um, including the, uh, the hoary bat, the red bat, and the silverhead bat, uh, those three species uh, we actually don't really know a lot about. So even though um, it's estimated that you know there may be thousands and thousands of these bats dying every year, no one really knows what that means in terms of their overall population. And my understanding too is that part of the problem is that. Um, for whatever reasons, they like to migrate along ridge lines, which is where they put the 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 windmills. 
Yes, that's why we've probably seen these really big um, mortality events uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. So let's let's get to. I interrupted you a little while ago when you said 2006. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in 2006 is when there was the first uh, documented case of white nose syndrome, which is this fungal disease uh, which shows up on hibernating bats in the wintertime. And it's called that because a uh, very obvious symptom is this white fuzz, which is the fungus growing on their muzzles. It also grows on their wings. And it appears to affect their water balance. It, it appears to make the bats arouse from hibernation more frequently than they would normally do. So they're burning off way more energy than they would normally do during the winter. And um, just being these little tiny bats, they don't have a lot of fat in reserve. So they um, become emaciated. They will um, fly out of the cave in the middle of the winter, in the middle of the day, and then they will go out on the landscape and, and perish. And so this started really showing up in uh, 2007 and 2008 in the Northeast, first in New York State, and then very quickly spreading to Vermont and other parts of New England and the Northeast. And it since has um, spread now to, to 25 states as well as five provinces in Canada. And the mortality from this can be um, horrible. Yeah, the mortality has ranged as high as 100%. So you may have a, a cave that once had a colony of, of bats, uh, you know, hundreds or even thousands, and down to a handful of bats, you know, two to three years later. And what, um, let's go through the syndrome a little bit in terms of where did it come from? How is it transmitted from cave to cave, bat to bat, and cave to cave? And what is um, the current prognosis and what 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 attempts are being made to um, do anything about it? Well, it's believed now uh, pretty it's pretty clear that white nose syndrome or that the fungus that causes white nose syndrome came from Europe. Uh, that fungus has been found in caves on bats in several different European countries on several different species. And, and is it, know, is genetic... it, does it harm them or is it, is it, are they used to it? It does not appear to harm them. Uh, they do not appear to get sick and they go through the winter with it on them. And as soon as they emerge from hibernation, they groom it off and they're fine. Okay. So it seems like, uh, They've probably been exposed to it for a very long time, and if it caused uh, adverse effects to them, it's, uh, they've adapted to it. So, but one thing I will say about that is that uh, North American bats, unlike European bats, this is my understanding, are hibernating bats in North America, at least certain species, uh, congregate in these enormous colonies uh, in the wintertime. So, like a colony of gray bats, for example, which is a federally endangered species and was so before white nose syndrome showed up, uh, would be in colonies of a million bats, just in one cave. And um, you, you don't see anything on that scale in Europe with the bats there. So it's possible that those bats used to be uh, in hibernating colonies much larger. But now, you know, what I read is that they're in colonies of you know, a few dozen or a few hundred. Well, this is sort of jumping ahead in the discussion, but I read mm -hmm. somewhere that, that um, one of the ways bats are adapting to this is by um, not snuggling so close to each other as they used to. Mm -hmm. Some of them are. Uh, that does appear to be perhaps a way that some of them are either adapting or simply, you know, the ones that do that, tend to do that, are the ones that are surviving. However, there are some species like the Indiana bats its um, its scientific name is Myotis sodalis, and sodalis apparently means social. It's called the social bat. So it's really wired to be snuggling, <laughs> to be in these huge agglomerations of bats as an adaptation to the challenges of you know getting through a cold winter. And Indiana bats don't appear to be adopting that behavior. 
And, you know, maybe they can't or maybe they won't do it in time. We don't know. But uh, not all of the species are affected. And there are seven species of bats that are affected right now um, so, are, are doing that. So how did it come over? Does anybody have any idea? No one knows for sure. It's been uh, speculated that it was brought by people, um, perhaps on caving gear or shoes or something like that. But the first site, the kind of epicenter, was a cave that was attached to a commercial cave. In other words, a cave that received tourists throughout the year. So, and that cave, and that cave received, you know, a couple hundred thousand visitors a year. So it's possible that, you know, traffic back and forth um, from Europe to North America, somebody brought it over, or maybe multiple people did, uh, and eventually this fungus found its way onto that. Okay, so um, what does it do to them? Well, so it's, you know, it will be in the environment in the cave, and then bats um, are either picking it up from the environment, that's probably initially how it gets started. Uh, once it's kind of rolling in a colony, the bats will pick it up from each other. And then as they go into hibernation and their body temperature drops to basically the ambient temperature of the cave, um, and they're also their immune systems appear to shut down. That appears to be one way they save energy during the winter. Hmm. And so they become basically unable to fight off this foreign organism that's growing on them. So the fungus is essentially growing on their flesh and growing into their flesh. And um, this causes all sorts of havoc, as you can imagine, uh, for their physiology. And it... Um... I haven't actually kept up with what's going on with it the last couple, three years. I know that it was exploding. Is it still um, exploding at the same rate, or has it slowed down, or what, what, what's happening with it? Yeah, it's still spreading. Um, as of last winter, and winter is when these new reports and new places show up. Uh, as of last winter, it had made it to uh, the... Um, uh, Great Lake states, so it's in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan now. Um, it's suspected in Iowa. Uh, it's in Arkansas. So it's really now essentially across the entire eastern U.S., except for uh, Florida and, and Louisiana. But it's in uh, it's in 25 states, and there's kind of a it's kind of a gap in the ranges of a lot of bat species in North America when you get to the Great Plains. So uh, most scientists think that this disease is eventually going to be entirely across North America. Um, it might take a little while to jump into the Rockies and over to the West Coast, but probably eventually we will see it to some degree throughout uh, you know, the U.S. and up into Canada. Are the um, are the are is there any sign at all that the bats are that the bats who have survived so far in the affected regions are developing any sort of tolerance to it, or is it mm -hmm. still having a you know ninety seven percent mortality rate per year, or whatever the well, percent rate really, is? Yeah, it really depends on the species. So. The little brown bat, which used to be ubiquitous in the eastern U.S. and also has this huge range that goes even into the western U.S. and up into western Canada. So that was our most common bat here. And, you know, it's been totally devastated by this disease, you know, mortality rates of up to 99% in the northeast and, and pretty high mortality rates even as you get to places where the disease has been present not quite as long. Um, but there are signs that uh, in these states like Vermont and New York, uh, where the disease has been present the longest, that some um, some populations are stabilizing. In other words, they're, they're like 1% of their former numbers, but it seems like they're staying there. Um, they're not, uh, scientists aren't really quite sure what's going on there, if that's a sign of true, you know, some kind of an, uh, immunity or some kind of resistance. Or it's simply that where they count the bats, which is 
um, primarily they count them in these caves or mines where they hibernate in the winter. Maybe it's just bats coming in from elsewhere, uh, maybe from smaller caves, um, and, and now they're sort of conglomerating in these places where scientists can count them. So it's not clear, but there are some indications that, at least for the little brown bat, there's some stabilizing. But again, I have to say, you know, they're stabilizing at an incredibly reduced um, fraction of what they used to be. Other species, like the northern long-eared bat, which is a species that I worked a lot on um, over the last few years, um, is showing no signs of having any leveling off um, of its decline. And the northern long-eared bat um, is a species that the group that I work for, the Center for Biological Diversity, had petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act in 2010. And uh, it's, it's declined 99% or greater. It's, it's virtually gone from Vermont, from New York, from most of the Northeast. And the mortality rates um, in other parts of the country um, seem to be on a similar track. So it really it depends on the species. Each one is affected in a slightly different way by this disease. And when this, this all is just breaking my heart. And uh, if... And I remember reading a report a few years ago about migratory songbirds that a lot of the songbirds along the East Coast had declined by 50 to 80 percent in the last 40 years. And that that broke my heart, too, until I realized that this is after Silent Spring. So this 80 percent decline was after a pre-existing 80 percent decline, which was after probably another 80 percent pre-existing decline with mm -hmm. habitat loss and urbanization. And mm -hmm. So one of the things I think about a lot, you know, I live in salmon country and um, I'm really happy when I see, you know, three salmon spy. I saw one salmon the other day. I was very excited. And, um, you know, there are accounts of, of, um, of the Klamath River just south of here, the entire river being black and roiling with salmon. So can you, you talk about these, you know, 99% declines and can you talk at all about what the extraordinary fecundity of of bats as well as others were prior to conquest or at least at least early on before before pesticides and everything else? Yeah, well, I mean I can just say that, you know, there's been there were accounts of people going into caves and particularly, you know, the real hot spot for that biodiversity in the world um, is probably in the American, uh, you know, Southern Appalachian and parts of the the Midwest. So we're talking about, you know, cave country like in Kentucky and Tennessee. And, you know, there would be this, these enormous um, colonies of bats that, you know, just would cover the entire roof of a cave that people would go into and, and great piles of guano that, <laughs> you know, batch basically that people would have to, you know, navigate to get into a cave. So there are these enormous colonies of bats. And, and you know, even now you can in some places um, see caves emerging, from, uh, excuse me, bats emerging from caves uh, at dusk. And, you know, people describe it as, you know, looking like smoke or a great storm spiraling out of the cave, um, but I'm afraid that, you know, those those are pretty much um, stories from the past, particularly with the onset of white nose syndrome now. You know, and, and it, of course, um, it's horrible for the bats themselves, and then, as always, you know, with everything being interconnected and everybody being interconnected, there are others who suffer, must suffer from this, too. I, I remember when I was a kid, either reading this article or seeing some nature program that kind of gave me the creeps, but had, it has stuck with me for, for decades now of the piles of bat guano, as I mean, we think of it, the piles of bat guano being crawling with insects who eat, various arthropods who eat the bat guano. So obviously mm -hmm. if there's a, you know, if there's a collapse in bat populations, that obviously is going to affect the entire natural community who lives in the cave. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I don't think that uh, there's probably a handful of scientists in the country that know anything about that system and to what degree it might be in peril um, because of the collapse of bats. And that's, of course, one of the great challenges, um, honestly, when we have to argue these things on the basis of science and, and rationality. And I was trained as a scientist, so we, you know, not like I don't believe in science, but we are often confined to these uh, arguments where we have to uh, say something on the basis of fact. And when you don't have the facts because no one studied a particular species or a particular ecosystem, it's very, very difficult. And so, yes, there are um, species. Most of them are quite obscure or not even described by science yet um, that appear to be dependent on bats and, and bat guano because in caves, you know, the, there's no sunlight, there's no photosynthesis, so the energy that those other species uh, depend on has to be brought in from outside and it's brought in by that. Um, so that has concerned me a lot. You know, what's going to happen to these cave ecosystems when bats aren't there any longer? And, um, you know, from my work that I, I face, I try to face these, um, horrors as directly as I can and describe them. But I have to tell you that it, even though I work with all this stuff all the time, it, um, it, it's really hard for me to hear you say the words when the bats aren't there anymore. I, I don't, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I feel the same way. And, you know, and I think uh, when white nose syndrome first showed up and uh, there was this one report and one news article after another about how this disease was wiping out these bats and it would just show up in one state and then it would show up in another state. And uh, I was, kind of a mess all the time um and you know i think that is one of the not very much talked about aspects of working on issues like this is how difficult it is to really not just be intellectual about it to really grapple with it and the reality of it and what it really means um to us as, as human beings So, um, was it Aldo Leopold who said that to be, basically to be environmentally aware is to live in a world of wounds? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, um, so what, what is being done? I want to go back to one more thing before I ask what's being done. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, it really, really bothers me that, um, this whole culture has the opposite of a precautionary principle in place for all these things. You have to prove some harm before you can stop some horrible activity as mm -hmm. opposed to erring on the side of caution. There's there's mm -hmm. actually when is it is it I don't remember the date, but this is the um this is soon right around now is the anniversary of Bhopal and there's a great line said by one of the people who was working with the victims of Bhopal, it's might actually been a victim of Bhopal who said this, that you should not be allowed to make a poison for which there is no antidote. And I think about that in terms of dams, clear-cutting, um, the introduction of exotics like this or chytrid. I think about this constantly, about how that's such a simple and intelligent notion that is completely absent. Um mm -hmm. So what is being yeah. done? What is what is being done to attempt to um, slow or stop or reverse this? Several things have been done. One is there's been actually quite a proliferation of research on white nose syndrome and bats, and so we've learned a lot about the disease and we learned a lot about bats uh, as a consequence of focusing on the disease over the last seven eight years. Um, so, you know, that's, that's to the good. Uh, there are now several uh, treatments that are uh, under 
development, and some of them appear to be promising. Uh, you know, there's also a troubling aspect to that, of course, is that, uh, you know, it, it, are we going to try to introduce these treatments, um, hopefully initially on a small scale, but, you know, wh what are the long-term, what are the what are the impacts going to be of potentially, for example, um, introducing some probiotic uh, bacteria that appears to have antifungal properties uh, into caves? And, uh, you know, if it's helpful to the bats, well, is it going to be harmful to other things in the cave? And it, thankfully, you know, some people are, are actually wrestling with these questions, but, um, you know, I'm not sure anyone's really going to know. Um, I don't think anybody will know for sure what's going to happen. Um, it's just, you know, we're, we're under this sense of urgency about what white nose syndrome is doing to the bats, but of course, as we just discussed, these are complex ecosystems, not just about the bats and the caves. So, so there are some treatments uh, under development. Um, some people have, have actually talked about and are starting to experiment with artificial hibernation sites, so uh, like old military bunkers, um, as well as there's been an artificial cave that has been built in Tennessee. And Wait, why, why would that be an advantage? I don't understand. If the problem yeah. is, is is a fungus that's carried on the bat at this point, why would, mm -hmm. it, why would a, a missile silo help? Because in between hibernation, um, you know, in between winters, you can... Uh, scrub that bunker clean, and you can get the fungus out of there. So, yeah, the bats may still come in, and they may still have fungus on them, but the fungal load is going to be lower. So the bats may be able to persist. Okay. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just in its infant stages, all these experiments that people are doing. But that's, you know, that's one of them. Again, it's kind of a crisis situation because, you know, it's not, not anybody's goal, or certainly not my goal, to see bats persisted because they're in artificial environments. But that's another thing that's being done. Um, one thing that was recommended early on, once we knew this was a, a fungus and that it appeared to be very contagious and very readily spread, um, was that people, one, stay out of caves unless they needed to go in there for some you know, important reason, like studying bats. Um, and if they had to go into caves, that they would decontaminate um, so they would hopefully remove uh, all this fungal material from their clothes and their boots and so forth. And um, that that particular strategy has, I'd say, been met with a mixed response. Um, the caving community, um, at least the vocal aspect of the caving community, has not been very happy about it. Um, and there have been caves uh, closed to um, recreational access um, on national forest lands in the eastern region and the southern region, and in some other parts of um, of the west, very very minimally, but um, on some public lands in the west as well, to try to prevent this this fungus from getting carried by people. You know, any any resistance to that? Um... Not the last, but any resistance to that really pisses me off. <laughs> it's like what, one of the things we face here all the time that just I hate more than almost anything is off-road vehicles. And mm -hmm. they want to run them in like endangered species habitat. And I understand, don't like the fights on, you know, jobs versus a species or energy versus species. And I hate all those. And I, I as you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I'm on the side of the species every single time. But when it comes mm -hmm. to recreation versus versus an imperiled species, it's like, are you kidding me? This is just it's mm -hmm. just ridiculous. We're talking about we're talking about recreation. That, yeah. This that that makes that makes that absolutely infuriates me. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean it has been very difficult for me to understand and you know, I mean there there are arguments that cavers try to make about how they're, you know, patrolling the caves and keeping the, the bad cavers out. And, you know, I, it, it all kind of rings hollow to me when I think about, well, if your first priority really was uh, survival of the species, 
I think you would do things differently. So well, what you would do is, if that's the case, what you do is you'd sit outside the entrance reading a book <laughs> and make sure nobody goes in. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So um, that's that's been a hard fight, and you know, for a number of years, I and the Center for Biological Diversity were, were really pushing that, and you know, I think there were conservationists that were quietly in support, but we got no backup from other conservation groups. There were public lands managers that were quietly in support, but they've been very loath to go up against the caving community, which is not, you know, not like cavers are a really dominant force in American politics, but even then, um, the public lands officials were not, uh, for the most part, there's a few exceptions, but for the most part, we're not very keen on, uh, you know, having these prohibitions on accessing caves. So I have to say that, you know, I've kind of let it go. And um, we, you know, we haven't seen a big jump into the West yet, but it's been my fear ever since this disease showed up that we would see, you know, a human transmission of, of the fungus into the West and then it would create a new center for the spread of the disease, and that may still happen. You know, there's a there's a pond right next to my house, and um, there's no inlet or outlet. It's just groundwater. And when I first moved here, some people were suggesting, why don't you put some goldfish in or something like that? And I never did because it's a lot easier to not put them in than it is to take them out when they wreak havoc. And mm-hmm. so it seems to me, actually, that the time to prevent the time to deal with white nose fungus is actually before it's in the cave by taking the preventative measures. I mean, Absolutely. it seems to me that that's, yeah. that that's a really just a, a no-brainer on what should be done. Yeah. I mean, the, it's, it, and this is true. You know, this is, this is one of the things where I obviously don't fit into this entire culture economy because I don't, it's like, I don't even care how much difference this makes to tourism. We're actually talking about entire living communities. And yeah. so even something huge, like, I mean, you said earlier that one of the theories is that it was brought into a commercial cave at first. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, when, I, when I was doing the interview last week about the monarch butterflies, they said one group that is opposing the listing of monarch butterflies as endangered are people who sell monarch butterflies for weddings, which is <laughs> I'd never even oh, heard God. of that before, but they sell them to be released at weddings, which is just so terrible on so many. I mean, the, the butterfly is going to die. And it's also, they were saying um, that, that it will introduce disease, but this is a group that is really arguing vociferously against ESA protection. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know, I'm, I'm wandering a bit of field, but I just, I just despair at the, at the ridiculousness of some of the arguments against protecting some of these creatures. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, well, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Well, just I, you know, like I know you have a, a a broad view on all of this, and I just I think about, um, you know, even though my job day in day out is is making these arguments about why we should be protecting species based on law and science, um, you know, I think about well, what what is it that really that can shake people out of this kind of narrow view of the living world around us? And, um, you know, what, is there anything that uh, can really reach people? And? Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I guess I, you know, I think that um, there's something about connecting with people's, uh, you know, their, their hearts, their values, what they really deeply care about. And, um you know, it's, it's interesting that um, there's been all these studies on, you know, how people can have all sorts of facts put in front of them and, um, you know, for example, on climate change. And the um, <laughs> facts are kind of meaningless if they're already kind of have their mind made up. And uh, so I, I think about, you know, how do we reach people um, given that, you know, maybe there's a certain group of people that already have their minds made up um, about species, or maybe there are people who don't have their minds made up but um, haven't um, really gotten in touch with what it would mean 
to them, not just sort of on a rational basis, but what would it mean to them to not have monarch butterflies in their life? Um, I don't know so much about bats, but, you know, monarch butterflies are things that most of us grew up with as, as school children. I certainly, they, I raised a monarch butterfly myself when I was in grade school. So I just, you know, I just think about these questions. I don't really have a particular answer except to say that somehow I think it has to do with what people uh, are deeply moved by. Well, and I know for myself that I um, have always been, I've all, I, I don't know that I want to say that I have loved bats the way I love meadowlarks or um, salmon, but um, I've always been really uh, attracted and fascinated by bats. And I, I have loved bats in, in a sense. There's, you know, when mm-hmm. I moved here, I live in Northern California, and even though white nose isn't out here, I, um, it used to be that I would probably see a half dozen bats during the summer, and, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes more often, if if I would sit out at dusk and uh, look, I live in a forest, so you can't see them very often because because um, they're black against the black background of the of the, the trees. Right. But if I sit at a certain place where there's a little bit of a skyline, I can see them just above the skyline fairly often. Mm-hmm. And the last couple of years, I haven't seen any at all. And mm-hmm. there's just this. Um, or remember when I was a kid. Um, my sister and her husband took me to um, the Alamo, and that night in the hotel, there were bats all over the hotel. And <laughs> my point on that is just that that was um, uh, we found out that the hotel um, staff routinely killed them, and so my brother and I were running, or my brother-in-law and I were running up and down the hallway with. Um, sheets holding a fire and one of us held a fire door open while the other ran up and down the hallway with sheets chasing the bats out and Mm -hmm. um my point is that they were a common enough occurrence in a hotel for them to have a policy of killing the bats yeah and my point is yeah the policy is terrible but my point really is that they were so common that they and maybe they still are in san antonio i have no idea but that's how ubiquitous they were Mm -hmm. it's just no big deal to actually have bats in your hotel yeah. One and last bit of the story, think, which is irrelevant to yeah. to the to the bats, but I think it's kind of funny. Is this was pretty late at night, and you know, I'm I'm probably I'm probably 13, and my brother-in-law is probably 23, and we're making a lot of noise. And this guy, we obviously woke some guy up, and he comes to his door and opens the door and says, "What are you kids doing?" And I said, "We're chasing bats." And he said, "Oh, okay," and went back to bed. <laughs> 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 Um, anyway, so what, what, um, we have about 10 or 12 minutes left, so we have a little while left, but Mm -hmm. before we get to the very, very end, what do you see as the prognosis for short term and middle term for, um, the affected, wait, let's back up before that. You said there are, Mm -hmm. I believe seven species of bats who are affected. Mm -hmm. Are there other species of bats who live in those regions who are not affected at all? Yes, okay. They are. And I mean, they they do they get the disease and it doesn't harm them, or they not even get the white nose white? Do they not even get white on their muzzles? Well, uh, so among the seven species that are affected, some of them, as we've talked about, are horribly affected. Others are um, not so badly affected. And the gray bats, uh, actually, there's not been a documented case of mortality among gray bats, even though they have been observed with, with white nose syndrome. So there's a whole spectrum there. Then there are other bats, some of them that are occupying the same caves and, and hibernating with these other affected species that don't get the disease at all. Uh, for example, the uh, Virginia big ears bat, which is a very imperiled species, a few thousand of them on the planet. And they've actually grown in number since white nose syndrome has showed up. No one really knows why, but um, it's it's possible that uh, as their um, you know <laughs> their compatriots um, have diminished in number, that perhaps the Virginia big-eared bat has done better. So 
there, yes, yeah, so there are species that have not been affected. Um, also, the migratory bats that I mentioned earlier that get affected by the wind turbines, um, they do not get affected by wet nose syndrome since they aren't hibernating in caves. So, um, so yeah, there are some bats that are not affected. Um, you know, one concern is that as wet nose syndrome spreads, that it may affect some other species because it'll get into the ranges of some other species. So what, okay, first, simply vis-a-vis -vis, um, white nose syndrome, what is your, what do you think is going to happen in the short term and middle term to um, bats in the affected areas? Do you think that they will um, start to start and I recognize it's different from zero mortality up to 99% mortality, but what mm -hmm. do you think is going to happen? Do you think the ones with a 99% mortality are going to be driven extinct? Well, I think short term, uh, like the little brown bat, which has been reduced to 99%, but appears to be possibly stabilizing in the Northeast, my guess would be that it's probably going to continue to persist. It will persist for sometime at uh, at these low numbers. Um, the northern long-eared bat, I think, is pretty much a goner in the northeast, again, you know, for the short to middle term. Uh, my, my concern is that, um, you know, with these species, and there's another one, the tricolored bat, which is down like 97% in the northeast, um, that they may persist, you know, in the absence of any other threats at these low numbers for a while and maybe over generations. And, you know, bats have actually very long lives. They have low reproductive rates and they have long lives. They're really more kind of like grizzly bears in sort of their reproductive strategy than, um, than they are like rodents, which is what people think bats are related to, and they're not. Um, so bats have these long generation times and for them to recover from these terrible declines will take a long time. So but how long, maybe they can do it. Go ahead. How long, how long until they have babies? I, I didn't know that. Well, they can have babies within a couple of years, but they will only have one pup, they're called, um, at best, um, per year. And, of course, a lot of them don't survive um, into adulthood. And, uh, and then these bats will live um, potentially you know, 10, 20 years, maybe even more than that. So that is just like uh, bears, because bears will have their first baby at two years, and mm -hmm. um, and they live for 10 to 20 years and have mm -hmm. have a baby every... Actually, with bears, it's a baby every other year. Mm -hmm. um, huh, yeah. I, I, I had no idea. Yeah, so their capacity to bounce back from a uh, decline like this is, is pretty limited. So, and then... My concern is that, you know, because of all the things that people are doing on the planet um, to disturb natural systems, that there will be something else that comes along or some chronic thing, some long-term trend like climate change that is going to uh, interfere with their ability to bounce back um, from white nose syndrome. So that's my sort of middle to long-term concern. So, yeah, that, that, that is something that breaks my heart, again, about all the stuff that's happening is that, you know, in previous extinction events, um, all but one of which are probably associated with really rapid climate change, there were still, they didn't even need to have wildlife corridors because the animals and plants could just flee. There was no habitat interruption. As mm -hmm. opposed to here, mm -hmm. there are multiple, not only do they have to deal with climate change, they're also have to dealing with endocrine disruptors and... Mm -hmm cavers and commercial cavers and fracking pesticide, pesticide. habitat loss yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um so if if they made you um the queen of all things white nose syndrome and you for the for the for the um for this exercise you can't uh bring down civilization or industrial agriculture <laughs> or um <laughs> Or you and you can't you can't even stop capitalism itself. I mean, we can we can we can that can be next week. But for this week, um, what would you do if you if you were appointed by Obama and Senate and Congress and it was verified mm -hmm. by the Supreme Court? So you basically have have power to do whatever you want. Mm 
concerning white nose syndrome, and they're mm-hmm. even going to take money from the military to. Oh, you know, awesome! You can you can throw <laughs> money at this thing too. What would you do? Well, you have a lot of money to throw at it, and you can do okay, basically great. whatever you want. Well, I would throw a lot of money on it because I would put a lot of money into developing developing treatments and uh, doing more research. And so that's one thing I would do. Um, the second thing that I would do is that I would close all the caves to all but, you know, essential access. And I would include in that, you know, some Boy Scout fell in and has to be rescued. They could be rescued. Um, if there's some other health and safety issue, you could go in. Um, if there's research to be done, um, particularly if it has to do with that, some white nose syndrome, but other research, then I would allow that. Um, but other than that, I would ask people and require that people refrain from recreating in caves uh, until we can resolve this problem. Uh, and then I would um, I would put prohibitions or at least have very strict requirements that any other activity that affects white nose syndrome uh, affects that, um, such as um, fracking such as um, use of pesticides on insects that bats eat. Um, and, and forestry, which is a, a huge, been hugely involved in pushing back against the protection of the northern longhead bat, for example, um, that, that all those activities have to come under stringent review in order to make sure that they're not destroying that habitat or directly affecting bats. And that's what I would do. I would also have a huge education campaign to get people to understand uh, why bats are important and how cool they are. So we haven't actually said that. And you don't need to apply it back to humans. I'm so sick of people always, like, whenever there's an endangered species, um, every single news article has to then go to why this is important to agriculture, why this is important to commercial Mm -hmm. fisheries or something. So, Mm -hmm. So I don't really care why they're important to agriculture or anything. Or mm-hmm. even necessarily to humans, but just tell me a why bats are important. I mean, just what you just said. Why are bats important to the world? And b why are they so cool? <laughs> well, I'm not sure I can separate those two things entirely, but um, I mean, bats are they're predators. They uh, they just happen to feed on insects, and they're the only flying mammal. So the only mammal that has the true ability to fly, and that's pretty cool. Um, They fly around in the dark, and uh, they have this echolocation, uh, you know, ability, so they can navigate in the dark, and they can find what they want to eat, and they can find their mate um, by sending out this sound and then listening to what comes back, and that's pretty amazing, and actually, people have, have learned things from studying bats that way. Uh, another thing that's really cool about bats, people may not realize, is a little, you know, little tiny thing, but um, you know they have their whole a whole social system and ways of communicating, and they actually, you know, they even have individual personalities, uh, which you know people think that any, everything besides their pets that isn't true for, but it is true. Um, and you know, with um, Mexican free-tailed bats, um, they live in these huge colonies. Uh, for example, there's a, a colony in uh, Texas called Bracken Cave, and millions of bats in there. And the mothers give birth to their to their babies, and then they have to leave at night to go hunt for insects. And and these so these babies are left in the cave, and then the mothers fly back to nurse their young. And in the midst of you know <laughs> these thousands of crawling little baby bats, the mothers are able to find. Hmm. their individual offspring. And I think that's just incredible. That's that's extraordinary. Um mm-hmm. so what what um I, I end a lot of interviews this way because I really want people to do something. So what if you live in if people live in the eastern United States or Western United States or Eastern Canada, Western Canada, maybe those are different things, what mm-hmm. do you want people to do? How can they how can they help um, how can they help bats? Well, you know, fundamentally, I, I mean, I say a lot of things about that, like, you know, write to your congressman or congresswoman. 
and support more funding for white nose syndrome. I say those kinds of things, and I and I will say them. I'll say them here. Uh, support protection of of the northern long-eared bat and other bats that are affected, and support endangered species protection because there's a lot of pushback right now against protecting the northern long-eared bat under the Endangered Species Act. So you know, political engagement is really key. Um, and I, but I think you know, deeper than that, what I would really love for people to do is to take the care that they have for bats and to turn it into something, turn it into a conversation, uh, turn it into a piece of art, turn it into something that has a real connection um, to them personally. Because I think that ultimately is what is going to have an impact. You know, we have a lot of prejudices against bats in particular. Um, you know, I have all sorts of horror stories about bats. And I think the more that people can understand how cool they are um, and what they mean um, on a personal level, you know, just your story about chasing bats in the hallway. I think those are the kinds of things that start to get under people's skin and start to maybe shift um, their view of, you know, of wildlife in general. Well, thank you so much for your work, and, and thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Molly Matson. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.